Good morning, uh, and I'm sorry that I can't be with you in London today for the ISCO UK conference. As you may have heard, I've had a slight accident and I'm not able to travel right now. Uh, but I hope at least that this presentation will add to the conversations that you'll be having uh, today and tomorrow around the theme of making a difference as knowledge organization professionals. And I guess the inspiration for my talk this morning uh, comes from a conversation I had some years ago with a colleague of mine who made this remark. He said, you know, if an engineer who's building a bridge makes a mistake, people die. If knowledge organization professionals make a mistake, people don't die. And this troubled me. It troubled me uh, for a long time. And when I was working on my book, Organizing Knowledge, I spent some time looking at uh, the case study of Victoria Klimbier. Uh, she was an eight-year-old girl who died of horrific abuse in London uh, in the year 2000. And the deeper that you look into cases like hers, uh, and there are many of them, the more we realize that there are actually knowledge organization issues and problems and failures in such cases. People do die uh, when uh, knowledge organization fails. The, the only difference between the engineer and the knowledge organization professional is that there is a chain of accountability to the engineer and there is no chain of accountability to the knowledge organization professional. Uh, when, just looking at the Victoria Klimbier case, between December 1998 and February 2000 when she died, she had come to the attention of three housing authorities, four social service departments, two metropolitan police child protection teams, one NSPCC specialist center, two hospitals and her school, who were all concerned about her. Let me read to you uh, just one piece of testimony that a social worker in the Lord Lemming inquiry into her death, um, uh, the, the, the evidence that she gave to the inquiry. Whenever we do a part eight case review, after a serious in incident, we have this huge chronology of information made available to the panel. And it is very frustrating to read that a long way before that happened, a pattern of things was emerging, but knowing that at the time, separate agencies held those bits of information. So GPs will be seeing things, accident and emergency will be seeing things, the police may be dealing with other aspects of what's going on in that child's life, and nobody is bringing it together. No body and no systems and no knowledge organization professionals. Not that there are no knowledge organization professionals in those agencies. We fail. And when we fail, sometimes people do die. And this is really the inspiration behind what I want to talk about this morning, which is if as knowledge organization professionals we do have impact, whether we like it or not, how do we equip ourselves to have impact. The first part of my title is from catalogers to designers. So by cataloger, what do I mean? I mean a person who makes a systematic list of items of the same type. Um, and, and you may have your own definitions. But essentially what a cataloger does is describe the world as it is. Let's look at a definition for designers. A person who plans the look or workings of something prior to it being made by preparing drawings or plans. So whereas the cataloger is present or past oriented, the designer is always future oriented. Uh, they're looking at the world as it could be. They're imagining and, and planning for the creation of the world as it could be. So Paul Otley, what's he got to do with this? Um, as many of you will know, uh, he's known as the father of information science. science. Uh, he was late 19th century, up to the, almost the middle of the 20th century, uh, and he carries late 19th century biases into the 20th century, and, but in many ways he prefigures what happens in the 20th century. Uh, he's the creator of the universal decimal classification, the originator of the universal bibliography, um, but he was also extremely active socially uh, and institutionally. He was a founder of the Union of International Associations. He was a key influencer of the League of Nations, the UN, and, and UNESCO. 
Uh, and the interesting thing about Otley was that he saw his bibliographic, his knowledge organization work as a key part of the architecture of having a social impact. If we look at uh, just this, this diagram that he, he drew in one of his publications, 1934, the Traité de Documentation, he has a whole world view that looks that starts with knowledge, with, with the world and knowledge about the world, knowledge in people's heads. And the integration of that knowledge is science, arts and science. It's, it's the domains of knowledge that we create socially. And these are expressed in books and documents and artifacts. And bibliography is the art of linking and integrating and connecting these pieces of knowledge into a, uh, a, a whole that can be made sense of, that can be navigated, that can be decomposed, can be recomposed in different forms, including in encyclopedic views. Uh, so it wasn't enough for him to be able to index and catalog books. He actually developed a system to index and catalog content, pieces of content within books that could then be cross-connected in various forms, in various compositions, in various uh, um, composites. And the science of classification was a key piece of this architecture to be able to connect these pieces of knowledge. Now, being of the 19th century, um, Paul Otley was a positivist. And in 19th century positivism, uh, uh, the idea is that as knowledge grows and is integrated, then society grows and develops uh, and matures uh, towards a more positive form. Um, and so for Otley, having an impact and being involved in institution building and infrastructural tools like cataloging standards and classification standards and classification tools and methodologies for bibliography and documentation, all of these things contributed to the knitting together of knowledge and the knitting together of knowledge contributed to the advancement of society. Now, that worldview is long gone. We no longer have that worldview. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we have a much more chaotic and complex view of the world and we no longer believe that we are necessarily evolving as we increase our access to knowledge. Uh, society will evolve to higher forms. Um, but Otley is a great example of a knowledge organization thinker and professional who worked at having an impact, having a wider social impact. He did knowledge organization because he cared about what was happening to society and he wanted to improve or contribute to the improvement of that. And he saw knowledge organization as a critical component in that. And that is an aspect that I think I would still uh, agree with. So let me introduce you to an almost exact contemporary, slightly younger, of Paul Otley. They knew each other. Um, this is Hugo Andres Chris. Uh, he was Director General of the Prussian State Library. He was founding member of IFLA in 1927, uh, produced the German Union Catalogue in 1931, extremely active in the League of Nations. Uh, he was everything that you might describe of as, as a as a very distinguished librarian, he was also a Nazi. And not just a Nazi, he was an extremely active Nazi. He was a member of the uh, Rosenberg Commission, uh, a leading member of the Rosenberg Commission, uh, which, which basically appropriated cultural heritage from Nazi-occupied territories during the war. Uh, and he was responsible for, uh, for the bibliographic aspects of the Ros Rosenberg Commission's work. He was an active supporter, a vociferous supporter of the Nazi book burnings in 1933. Uh, when the Deutsche Freiheitsbibliothek was set up uh, in Paris to house the books that were being destroyed by the Nazis, uh, was established in 1934. Uh, Chris spoke out vehemently against it and in fact that library was destroyed uh, upon the occupation of Paris in 1941. 
So here you have a distinguished librarian deploying the tools of knowledge organization and of librarianship uh, in support of uh, an ethical stance that many of us, I think, would disagree with uh, quite violently and, and uh, sort of in instinctively. What does this say? Both Otley and Chris wanted to have an impact and in fact did have an impact in society and in the world. Uh, they had impact in opposite directions. In fact, the last time that Chris and Otley met was in December 1940. Uh, Belgium was occupied and Chris, who had known Otley through professional uh, conferences uh, over many years, uh, was visiting Otley to assess Otley's collection. He had his eye on the Universal Bibliography, the millions and millions, 15 million items catalogued in the Universal Bibliography. He wanted that uh, for his collection, for the Rosenberg Commission's uh, collection. Uh, <clears throat> his uh, lieutenants went through um, Otley's uh, uh, a collection of ephemera artifacts and so on, uh, took what they wanted and destroyed um, some uh, <coughs> 63 tons of material they considered rubbish uh, from, the, from the Nazi point of view. So here you have meeting in December 1940, two people who believed strongly in the impact uh, <laughs> of knowledge organization in the world, uh, meeting in opposite directions with completely different uh, stances. What does this say to us? Well, to me, it points up, first of all, the absolute importance of having an ethical frame as knowledge organization professionals. Why? Because whether we like it or not, as knowledge organization professionals, we are ethically implicated. If you've read uh, the Bauke and Starr book, Sorting Things Out, uh, you will know exactly what I mean. Uh, in the, the core of that book, um, they analyze the, uh, the work of knowledge organization and taxonomy and classification in, that supported the apartheid regime uh, in uh, South Africa, and they have many other case studies in there. And there are many other examples. I, I started with one, the case of Victoria Klimbier in, in 2000, which demonstrate the ethical implication of the work that we do. Whether we like it or not, whether we have an ethical stance, whether we are ethically neutral, whether we say we are ethically, ethically neutral or not, what we do has an impact. Now, there is this debate about the ethical neutrality of, um, of librarians and of and by implication of knowledge organization professionals, although they're not exactly the same thing. Um, in 1962, Douglas Foskett uh, made a very famous speech called The Creed of a Librarian. Uh, no morals, no religion, and no politics. And there's a very famous passage that's very often quoted. During reference service, the librarian ought virtually to vanish as an individual person, except insofar as his personality sheds light on the working of the library. He, or she, must be the reader's alter ego, immersed in his politics, his religion, his morals. He must have the ability to participate in the reader's enthusiasms and to devote himself wholly and wholeheartedly to whatever cause the reader has at the time of the inquiry. He must put himself in the reader's shoes. <clears throat> and this is often taken as an argument for neutrality, that whatever the cause, the librarian steps aside in the service of the cause that is, is being pursued by the client or by the community. Now, there are some very famous uh, cases or explorations of this. Uh, for example, Robert Hauptmann, who went on to become a great ethical thinker in librarianship, uh, did an experiment in 1975 where he visited 13 libraries, reference librarians, and asked about uh, materials that would help him to build a bomb that could destroy an average-sized home. Uh, and, and clearly what he was doing was, was communicating implicitly that what he wanted to do was to destroy somebody's house. In all 13 cases, the librarians gave him the information he wanted. 
uh, and some of them smirked uh, and said, "Well, you know, uh, when you, while you're at it, why don't you um, blow up my library?" The only one of his respondents actually articulated an ethical stance on it, uh, and and the ethical stance was exactly the the interpretation of Foskett that I just uh, uh, described, which was sure. Um, abs absolutely, whether I agree with you or not, I am obliged to give you the information that you need because I am neutral. Uh, Robert Dowd did a very similar experiment in 1989. Um, he went to librarians asking uh, how to get information to uh, find out how to freebase cocaine. The only difference between his and Hauptmann's uh, uh, case study was that Dowd was self-harm and Hauptmann was clearly harming of others. Um, uh, Dowd came to the opposite conclusion, although he had the same results, everybody helped him. He came to the opposite conclusion. He, he said this was actually uh, a good thing that librarians simply followed the need of the customer. The, the death of Victoria Climbier is another ethically implicated case. In my book, I also talk about the case of a Filipino, uh, Filipino, uh, a, a, an Australian citizen who had originally had been born in the Philippines who was deported back to the Philippines in 2001 from Australia um, because essentially uh, there were 13 different versions of her name in the databases of the Department of Immigration and they couldn't resolve the identity of the person they had in front of them with the identity of the person who was listed as a citizen. Knowledge clear, knowledge organization problem that resulted not in death but in deportation of somebody who happened to be mentally ill. Um, Sanford Berman in the US has done a lot of work on the uh, ethical uh, implications of uh, knowledge organization and specifically of cataloging and, uh, and had a long campaign for many years against the move towards standard uh, cataloging and classification uh, practices because they decontextualize um, the uh, descriptive work that we do around knowledge content. Uh, from the needs of the community that uh, they're relevant to. And going to standards turns to generic uh, terms, terminologies that people don't have, uh, uh, actually use. For example, going to Library of Congress means that you will need to, to know that Viagra, if you're looking for Viagra, uh, is described as sildenafil and Viagra doesn't exist or at that time didn't exist. Uh, in 2005, Sanford uh, Berman made a very uh, famous speech on the, um, how should I put this, the trend in posh new libraries to try to exclude the marginal, marginalized in society, particularly homeless people who would use the library for warmth uh, in winter and, and uh, to, to sleep in it um, by enacting rules against offensive body odor. Uh, <clears throat> And this, so, so uh, uh, what this is saying is that in the absence of an ethical stance, clear ethical stance, in this uh, false sense that we are ethically neutral, that we serve other people's ethics, we are exposed to being manipulated by unethical positions and people and institutions. And my last example on this slide uh, is an example of that. This is uh, Popline, which is the largest uh, healthcare, um, reproductive healthcare database in the world. It's run out of USAID uh, in the US. Um, and in 2008, they came under pressure from the then Bush administration, which was anti abortion, to remove an item um, on abortion from their database. And having reviewed it, they thought, okay, it's not within our collection development policy, fine, we'll remove it. But then they went an extra step and they said, you know, to avoid this problem happening again, why don't we just remove uh, abortion from the taxonomy? We'll make it a stop word. Uh, and overnight, um, um, several thousands of items related to abortion uh, could no longer be retrieved by using that keyword in search. It took some weeks uh, for the library and research community to catch up to this, and there was a stink about it. It went to the New York Times, 
uh, and it was eventually reinstated. But it's an example of political pressure being uh, placed on knowledge organization professionals. Uh, now, that particular decision was not in an instruction to remove the word abortion, uh, but they kowtowed to their political masters in order to avoid future trouble. And they anticipated and enacted and enabled an unethical um, stance. Whether you agree with abortion or not, uh, removing reproductive health care uh, materials from access is, to my mind, clearly unethical. I mean, you may disagree with me. And the fact that that can happen, almost undetected, it was several, several weeks before uh, the community woke up to the fact that this was happening. So all of this says is that whether we like it or not, we are ethically implicated. And if we are ethically implicated, we need to have a way of thinking about uh, an ethical stance. Now, actually, there is quite a lot of material, not in the knowledge organization space, but in the library space around uh, ethical frames and ethical values. Uh, and this is an example of a, a, a very good book, uh, a very comprehensive framework for thinking about ethical values uh, in librarianship, Michael Gorman's book, Our Enduring Values. And he has a number of uh, key values, stewardship, in, in terms of we're carrying things from the past into the future, service, which also involves service of uh, different communities, intellectual freedom, uh, respect for intellectual freedom. And, and there, I think, there is a case for a degree of what, uh, what McMenemy calls um, rational neutrality, not blind neutrality, but rational neutrality, respecting the, the, the fact that there are different uh, points of view and supporting them. Uh, rationalism, taking a reasoned, predictable, uh, user-oriented approach, Literacy and learning enabling uh, people to use information and knowledge resources. Equity of access, very important. Uh, respect for privacy and support for democratic principles. Now, we may or may not agree with all of these. Not all of these are embodied in the many uh, codes of ethics in librarians' uh, associations around the world. Um, but they provide a pretty useful ground for establishing an ethical frame. So there is there is work there. Now, there are other areas that we've touched on that are not explicitly covered. Um, for example, uh, resp uh, respect or enabling the common good uh, is implicit but not necessarily explicit in, in codes for librarians who tend to be uh, oriented around public librarianship, uh, not necessarily the diverse uh, uh, contexts in which we as knowledge organization professionals work. Um, respect for intellectual property is, is a very important one, um, which sets up its own dynamics, uh, conflicts. Um, avoidance of harm. If we think about the Victoria Klimbia case uh, and other cases I've mentioned, uh, creation of good. Uh, what we do, if, we, if what we do can help people avoid harm, uh, what we do can also uh, enable people to create good for society or for social groups. And key, I think, in the current uh, domain is enabling sense-making, enabling sense-making for policy makers, for strategy makers, for decision support, for avoidance of risk, and for identification and taking of opportunities. And this is an area, I think, that we have really no framework for thinking about as knowledge organization professionals. And particularly if we're stuck in this stance, you know, we just do what we're told. We're just helping our clients or our employers or our communities to get access to the stuff that they need. We're not taking a proactive stance. We're taking a passive stance. Uh, and this goes back to my earlier distinction right at the beginning of this talk, that we are formed as catalogers and as describers and we are not formed as uh, designers or active uh, creators of a new reality. So let me very quickly uh, take you through a framework for thinking about where I think um, we need to be starting to have this kind of dialogue. Uh, this framework, we could think of it as a set of force fields. On the right, you can see there's the domain of order, 
Uh, and on the left, you've got the domain of disorder. And, and clearly, as knowledge organization professionals, we are formed and created and trained and working in the domain of order, right? So we're, we're structuring, we're ordering, we're organizing stuff. It's built into uh, our name, organization, knowledge organization. Um, perhaps the north and south uh, poles need to be described a little bit better. The commons, I think we, at the bottom, we, I think we pretty much uh, understand. Sequestration, um, <clears throat> I probably need to des describe a little more detail. Um, I'm defining it as the act of taking legal possession of assets, the act of taking forcible possession of something, or the act of separating people from other people. And sequestration in the context in which I want to talk about is the um, bounding or enclosure of assets, in this case knowledge and information assets, for economic advantage. And if uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Scottish history will um, immediately understand uh, the, the context of enclosure, because in the, in the 17th and 18th centuries, much of the land in Scotland, which was formerly treated as a commons for common uh, exploitation uh, by the community, uh, started to become increasingly enclosed by landowners. And the reason why uh, it was being enclosed was for economic advantage. You could actually put in infrastructure, you could invest in infrastructure to get greater productivity out of the land if you enclosed it. Um, but the social costs of that were enormous because people who were living on the land had to be uh, evicted and excluded uh, from the access to this what had commonly uh, what had previously been a commons so this is why sequestration and the commons are at opposite poles you sequester assets in order to be able to invest um, but in order to sequester, you have to remove things from the commons. And this means that some people will be marginalized, some parts of the community will be excluded uh, from being able to enjoy the benefits uh, of these assets. So if we look at uh, the social forms that exist in these different domains, in the combination of sequestration and order is typically dictatorships. Um, uh, it's Assets are sequestered by fiat, and they are highly structured and rules-based uh, top-down. If we look at the domain between order and commons, it's typically a utopia, right? And utopia is generally not that realistic. Um, but they're generally very highly structured, so this is why they're in the domain of order. If we look at the domain uh, between disorder and the commons, you have cooperatives, and cooperatives tend uh, to be messier than utopias, and uh, utopias don't work, cooperatives sometimes do work. And up in the top left, in the domain between sequestration and disorder, we have competitive oligopolies. So we have large entities, and we know these entities uh, in, in, uh, in today's world, the Googles, the Apples, uh, the Amazons, uh, the Walmarts, and so on, who are enclosing uh, large segments of the market, in some cases, large segments of the information and knowledge domain. Uh, Facebook, uh, Google are very good examples of that. Uh, and, and they are fighting each other uh, for control, and they are excluding um, other people from it. In fact, tempting us uh, into their domains so that they can exploit us. As knowledge organization professionals, we sit quite firmly, as I said, towards the right-hand side uh, of this framework. Um, and, you know, Otley and Cruz, in their ways, represent the different extremes. I mean, Cruz uh, is representative of uh, a knowledge organization professional working in a dictatorship mode. Uh, Otley uh, was working in a utopian mode. Um, Neither of those actually ended up being uh, very sustainable, um, but they uh, certainly had impact in terms of what they were doing, uh, and they supported the social form uh, that they were oriented towards. Over on the left-hand side, there are other players that we probably need to be more familiar with. 
So in the cooperative space, you've got the sharers, you've got the open source movement. As we move up towards competitive oligopolies, you've got the entrepreneurs, you've got the people who are starting businesses and seeking out areas in which that they in in which they can uh, exploit, uh, create value. Uh, they're innovating, and ultimately their goal is actually to move northwards, is to be able to sequester some form of asset and exploit it economically. Up in the north, uh, we have publishers, uh, in, and we know these sort of these these uh, controllers of large scale content. Um, the databases, the, the journals, the publishing houses, and so on, and they're all working increasingly in the digital domain and, and seeking to maintain their control over the assets that they have sequestered and enclosed. And uh, in, the, in the competitive oligo oligopoly space, the Googles, the Apples, the Amazons, and so on, you have the data farmers. In fact, you could argue that Amazon is not uh, any more about books, it's about data. It's about understanding and attracting behaviors into their space that they can then analyze and exploit as, uh, as data. Each of these orientations has its own knowledge organization uh, form and framework. In the dictatorship space, there are the hierarchical classification schemes with which we are all familiar. And, the, and hierarchical classification schemes privilege specific um, uh, perspectives. And that's why they sit in the dictatorship space. Down in the utopian space, you have universal ontologies. Universal ontologies attempt to describe the world uh, definitively in all its possible forms to serve all possible needs. And like utopias, universal ontologies will never, ever uh, be realistic. Um, and simply because you cannot uh, use the same framework to describe all things for all people. Uh, not that people don't try to do this. Moving on to the left-hand side, the, the, the form that we're most familiar with from the cooperative space is the folksonomy. Uh, and uh, folksonomies, for us, um, are indicators of uh, viewpoints that we can farm and bring over into the audit space, into our taxonomies, into our faceted taxonomies, and so on, uh, into our thesauri. Uh, but folksonomies in themselves, uh, to us, uh, tend to be uh, regarded in fairly low light. And then up in the north, we've got big data. We've got the, uh, uh, the um, acquisition and enclosure of large-scale data and the application of black box algorithms. Uh, so one of the great things about big data is that we have these wonderful case studies. We have absolutely no idea how these insights were achieved. Uh, into into the data that was uh, uh, represented in the in the case study, uh, and that's very important. That's part of the enclosure. The sequestration uh, is to create opaque uh, areas, domains of data, and opaque ways of analyzing it, uh, so that the smart stuff that we pull out of it uh, cannot be um, or the methodologies that we use cannot be used by our competitors. My argument is this. As knowledge organization professionals, we need to move more towards the center of this domain. Why? Because in order for us to play in the space that is growing most rapidly, we need to understand the domain of disorder and the different communities that are working within the domain of disorder. And we need to be able to serve them, and we need the skills and tools to be relevant to them. Because this is where all of the activity is happening, over on the left-hand side. Large-scale, disordered, or competing orders. Um, and we have an incredible tension between sequestration and value to the few, and the commons and value to the many. And as ethically implicated professionals, we need to be working in this middle space to mediate this tension. We are too safe, we are too secure 
in the domain of order, and we need to change that. But we are not formed professionally. We are not um, developing ourselves professionally. We have no active, proactive, future-oriented stance where we go out and we identify needs and benefits and risks and ethical uh, dilemmas to be addressed and we design solutions that will create a better future for our employers, for our clients, for the communities that we serve. If we want to make a difference, we need an unembarrassed ethical stance. We need to recognize the wider impact of our work, make ourselves accountable for the consequences of what we do. We need to move from being formed as passive service professionals to activist design professionals. And design professionals simply means we need to acquire new skills. We need skills in, in design itself, design of services, design of tools, design of apps, and design of infrastructure to support social groups benefiting uh, from these, this wealth of connections and information and data and knowledge that surrounds us. We need business analytics skills, which gives us the ability to define purposes and outcomes and measurable um, uh, outputs to the work that we do. We need skills in user needs analysis so that we can understand what benefits we can create, what risks uh, we need to avoid, what harm we need to avoid. We need uh, skills in a knowledge of the technology tool sets as they evolve and the capabilities of the technologies and the constraints of the technologies. We need to become much more literate in the different technologies that are out there. Open source search, uh, graph databases, uh, to name just a few. We need to be able to build skills in enabling sense-making uh, from diverse and large information and data sets. We need to open up these black boxes that are being created by the competitive oligopolies. We need to create a big data space uh, where data can be analyzed by transparent public standards so that we know when an outcome uh, is identified, when an insight is identified, we know what it means and we know how it was derived. We need to be working in that space. If we don't work within that space, then we are being untrue uh, to who we are. It is not really, to my mind, a question of how do we make a difference. We are already making a difference. We are enabling all kinds of institutions, uh, whether commercial or non-commercial, to do their work. We the what we do has consequences, sometimes quite serious consequences, and we need to be accountable for the consequences of what we do. And we need to be acquiring the skills and the activist design stance in our education, in the research that we sponsor, in the professional formation that we undergo, in the way that we associate as professional associations. It's not a matter of making a difference. We already make a difference. The question is, what do we do to make a difference in a more conscious and methodological way? And how we, do we develop ourselves to be able to do that? I hope you have a wonderful conference. Uh, my email address is on this slide. You can drop me an email, um, challenge, question, respond. Uh, have a wonderful day. And thank you very much.